me, those kind of three key men, you know, if you notice, I keep saying men. So you're talking about my dad, you're talking about my uncles, you're talking about Wesai, you're talking about Dr. Carlton House, and you're talking about Raymond Douglas, Dr. Martin Glynn, and it's consistent men, black men that were in my life that were kind of shaping and molding of how I thought and how I think about this phenomena that I was trying to discover. So then that's kind of the creative element. I think that was kind of the blessing that I think that me and Ray connected because Ray is, I would say, is my creative mentor in the sense that Ray would kind of give me ideas and then Martin would kind of say something and say, try and do that. Yeah. And that's when the whole concept of the Real Talk, Real Action started. Mm -hmm. So in the local community, I was doing kind of discussions that was focusing on issues that young people were talking about, things like stop snitching, things like, um, you know, in relation to violence, what's your view, what's your perspective, single mothers, what are the struggles, you know, masculinity, we were talking about identity. So things that young people wanted to talk about and we'd be able to have like debate forums. And there were some days we would have like groups of like 50, 60 young people. And we're talking about young people from the ends. So we're not talking about an event where professionals and people, youths from the ends will come in because they realize that yo, being around articulate people is the thing to do. So even a couple of the road men that will probably end up sitting there thinking, yo, I like that girl there, but in order for me to talk to her, I have to be speaking at a certain level. And that's what was happening in the community. So I would say that once that kind of started to happen, I started then to document right. what I was doing because nothing changed. I was always working with these young people from when I left my first degree, but I started documenting what I did and I realized that nobody was doing it on YouTube. And that's how I started my YouTube page. If you go to my earliest videos on YouTube, I'm standing in front of the camera outside of the youth center talking about an issue that's taking place in the community. And I noticed I started to gather a little bit of a following. So one of the questions that I was kind of asked a lot is, you know, why are our young men engaging in violence? And at that time, I was working with probably 96% young men that didn't have fathers. And that's where the advice to a son birthed. And I would say that's what bossed me, the advice to a son. Because when that came out, everyone was like, who is this geezer from Brom that's managed to get gang members, men that are on the road, men that have done things on camera to talk about what advice they would give to them to their younger selves. Yeah, yeah. But that also came with about conflict as well because it had, you know, young women, mothers from the community saying, how have you got this person on camera? And I don't think that you should have done that and whatnot because obviously I understand that these individuals were actually still involved in yeah. the things that, uh, or the negative things that we hear about in our community. Um, but it wasn't about that. It was about these individuals are reflecting and understanding that, yeah. you know, they've made negative and poor life choices. But if there was to speak to their younger self, then this is what it would be. Like, yeah. So then when I kind of done the, um, uh, the, the showing of advice to a son, a girl come to me and said, why don't you do advice to a daughter? Mm -hmm. Then it started again. Um, and I would say those two kind of documentaries was my, made Craig Craig yeah. for the world to see. Because in the community, people knew who I was, but for the world to see, yeah. it was those documentaries. So the YouTube kind of continued, the social media, if you remember. Yeah. Now, we had your Facebook, your um, Twitter, yeah. your LinkedIn start coming in. And all I did was just kept consistent. Because you, you were the guy, I mean, yeah, I, obviously I've seen this journey mm -hmm. for almost 10 years now, but definitely, when I started seeing some of the stuff you were doing, the documentaries, mm -hmm. the consistency yeah. mm -hmm. and the quality of it as well, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, this is a different realm. Mm -hmm. We're not used to seeing this level, level of professionalism yeah. in, a, in a youth sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was so, whether you were in Birmingham or not, it translated across the same stuff we're going on in London and stuff. I just want to... Let's just for a moment, because this is so helpful, even what you've just said there, for people to understand the journey. Because I think what you find is a lot of people will jump in and jump out. And what you have demonstrated is consistency. Yes. You've spoken about mm -hmm. the, the modeling, the role models around you. Some of the guys I know, I testify they are as amazing as you've just articulated. I want to talk about the young people. Yes. Because what we've got right about now some people are talking like this is a new thing. Mm -hmm. Media, tabloids, press, government, everyone, it feels like for me, working in this field for 20 years, more than ever, the hype um, and how the stories are coming out about youth violence in particular, mm -hmm. knife crime, not just in London, but across the country. Yes. 
What's your take on this? Mm-hmm. What do you feel is going on with our young people? Mm-hmm. Is it a new thing? Some of the solutions, what do you think is going on here? Well, part of my PhD, because I'm doing a PhD now, um, and my PhD um, focuses on the correlation between social media and violence. And more specifically, it's called Internet Beef, Making Sense of Social Media Gangs and Violence, specifically in Birmingham. So one of my opening chapters, um, I'm talking about gangs in Birmingham. Now, it's brought me to the early 1800s, where the first kind of um, media kind of demonstration or kind of mention of gangs were during that time. Um, So the phenomena of gangs and violence is not new. It's not a new phenomena, but every kind of era would always present like it's a new phenomena. So I'll talk about kind of the similarities and the differences. So the kind of social factors or the indicators that created those environments for young people to join gangs are the same. Things like poverty, austerity, dysfunctional households. We're talking about domestic violence. We're talking about lack of role models, whether that's male or female. Um, Young people having limited resources, things um, that they're unable to do. Uh, we're talking about you know, young people that have perceived fears within their communities and environments that then make them start to develop ideas, thoughts, and behaviors that start to make them behave and act a certain way in their local communities. Limited police resources and so on and so forth. So all of those different social factors created environments for young people as young as seven and eight to be involved in violence. So when you kind of hear now the tabloids are, these kids are getting younger and it's county lines and it's Mm. exploitation, you can look at 1876 in Birmingham and you'll find that eight and nine-year-olds will go in jail for not necessarily um, just um, stealing and robbery, but some of them even got caught with guns. Ten-year-olds being caught with guns, 11 and 12-year-olds. And you might remember, you know, kind of Professor Chin's work that talked about the Peaky Blinders and that's how we knew about the Peaky Blinders for Birmingham specifically. And then you've got others that talk about, you know, the sluggers before the Peaky Blinders and then the Brominum boys. And then, but the narrative was exactly the same. Something was happening in the society that created environments for these young people or young men or young women at that time to mobilize and create subgroups, which we know as, as gangs. So if we fast forward now and we talk about, okay, um, the early 80s, 90s, going into the 2000s, some of the differences are things like migration. Naturally, so the the environments remained the same, and we're talking about post-industrial revolution and whatnot. The environments remain the same because now what you find now is that the industrial revolution means that technology is now kicked in. So the need for people to be hands-on and not needed no more. And you got to think that if you talk about people that migrated into this particular country, came with trades, you know, they were good with their hands, and they were working in the factories and whatnot. And now you're not needed because now it's machinery that's creating these things. So a lot of those communities um, that came with a trade, that didn't come with criminal records, that came to create and build the empire for it to be great, to make Great Britain great, those same communities now, um, because they're not needed, you find now that they're in those environments, now they're finding that they need to try and make money. So now when you talk about things like young people then going into forms of criminality, all you're finding is young people creating groups. And those groups are like almost like surrogate families. And then you've also got to bear in mind is that during those times as well, you had issues around racism. So it wasn't the fact that people were joining groups for the fact that they were in, in trying to get involved in criminality. They were also doing it for protection. Yep. And some groups were also forming themselves because they realized that they knew that self-development um, is what's going to be key in order to kind of change the reality of what's going on for their children. You go to America and you look at the Black Panther Party, um, you look at the Deacons of Defense in the South, and these different types of groups will realize that, right, that we needed to come together in order to deal with the fact that we might not be needed according to the state, but we need to try and figure out what's going on. And then something happened. Drugs came into the community. Them same guns that were used in war came back into the community. So whereas now those same subgroups now are protecting each other from the outsiders, they're now turning on each other because now it's about economics, now it's about power, now it's about geographical space and territory and respect. And all of these things are starting to change. Now we fast forward a little bit more. What do we have now? We look at austerity. We look at the impact of austerity. As I said, when I was working in the, in the youth service, that's when youth service was popping. 
There was money there to do activities with young people. Post-2010, um, millions just started to get cut out. And these predicting factors, we were all saying even 10 years ago, it would happen if you start doing those things. So then when you start to take away all of those things, we go back to the same situation again in 1876. The poverty, the deprivation, the austerity, the dysfunction of households, the rise of domestic violence and mental health and fear, perceived fears within those communities. But now it's sporadic. And it's sporadic now because now we're finding new environments, new groups of people and new faces engaging in the, in the behavior because now we have social media. Mm. So through a click of a button, I'm able now to see your reality through my lens. Right. And your reality is the same as my reality, just that we look very different. Mm. So I can then look in Chicago and realize that, okay, that's a murder capital of the world, but guess what? Them drillers, yeah. terminologies, where them ups, them individuals over there are going through the same things we're going through because we're poor too, mm. we're struggling too. But the only way that they seem to engage with their issues is through picking up weapons and harming individuals that might live in their geographical spaces. Right. So now when we convert that now to what's going on here yeah, and you yeah. listen to the language yeah. and the things in which young people are saying, they're saying exactly the same thing. They're telling the same story through different lenses yeah. but very similar. So then now you got a kid now that might live in Buckinghamshire that's also able to look on social media and think, okay. Yeah. So when you're fighting, that's how you're supposed to fight. Okay, when you got beef, that's how you're supposed to respond to the beef. And then we can go back for the oldies that might be watching this. Who remembers happy slapping? <laughs> Who remembers the riots? Yeah. Remember it's through technology that people were able to mobilize and engage in certain types of behavior. So we know that social media also is a contributing factor to the way in which other young people and individuals kind of come together and do certain types of behaviors. So now we kind of have an environment now where we have kind of like a forest fire. Right where it's no longer the ends, it's no longer just the spaces that historically would have been the, the most deprived areas. We're seeing violence now and similar types of violence happening in, in different types of um, parts of the country. But that also is the fault of us as adults as well, because when you talk about local authority and statutory organisations, when you things like people being moved from borough to borough, or right. people being moved outside of the major cities and then put into different spaces, nobody's dealing with the problem. All we're doing is removing the problem and pulling it somewhere else. And then when that problem is almost like a disease, when you're looking at the concept of violence, it is a disease, that disease then spreads to someone else because someone's contagious. And you haven't cured that individual. If I put that, that virus somewhere else, other people are gonna start getting infected with the virus. So now we have this new phenomenon, county lines, but exploitation of young people has always taken place. Mm. You know, you can look at the stories of Oliver Twist. Was well, that not county lines? But what we do now is, again, every era kind of present this issue as a new phenomena. So we, and then way. we give it a new yeah. label yeah. and then all of a sudden now you've got county line specialists. Before that it was CSE. Before that it was girls and gangs. Before that it was gangs. Before that it was prevent. And what we find then is the convey about... Yeah with different labels, changes, but the people from different communities mm. stay in the same places. So and those that are most right. affected yeah. are always gonna be the most deprived areas anyway, yeah. because they was affected before. Yeah. It's now that they're more affected. And now we've got social media, we're able to see it more now. So now we're thinking, oh my God, we're hypersensitive, violence, I don't wanna let my kid outside, mm. which contributes to the new factors that I'm talking about as now, because we're now scaring our children even us as adults, even those that are not involved in any form of criminality, we tell our children, stay inside. I don't want you to go outside messing with these things. And you got to think of an eight or nine year old, my son's eight, he's going to be saying, but why don't you want me to go outside? Because the normal thing for a child to do is yeah, go outside. outside. We went outside when we was growing up. So we're saying, to them, don't go outside, don't go outside. Because, because, because they're watching on the news. They're hearing things at school. They find out that someone got stabbed up the road or one of their friends got stabbed and someone's dead. And they start realising, well, then maybe it's scary to be outside. And this is interesting because one of the things I want to kind of close on, what you just said is the trauma side of stuff. So what I always say is that it was very different for me in comparison to some of the kids mm -hmm. growing up. Like, if I ever was going to get involved in a fight, I would think to myself, well, I might get a punch in the ribs yes. or I might get a, a black eye. Yes. I never at one point thought, do you know what, this might be the day I'm going to lose my yeah. life. Yeah. That's just mm -hmm. the yeah. generation mm -hmm. I was in. And bear in mind, I grew up in the uh, 
the shadow of Stephen Lawrence being murdered yes. a mile away from my school. So it's not like we're not uh, aware of knife crime. But the point is, I never thought I was going to get stabbed. Whereas what I notice now is like what you just said, there's a trauma across the community, a collective trauma, and a moral panic, which an average young person is dealing with. Yes. Um, and one of the things which I noticed when, especially in America, mm. when we started seeing, being recorded, the police brutality and, yes. and black people being killed, I picked up that I was suffering from secondary trauma. Yeah. So as we close, because honestly, I think we're going to need to do a part two. Yeah, we are. Because there's so to. much yeah, going yeah. on here. Mm -hmm. um, just talk to me about the impact of trauma and fear mm -hmm. in, in, with the people you've worked with. How mm -hmm. important is this and what do we need to do to try yeah. and reverse this if possible? I want to answer this in two stages Please if you'll allow me to. Yeah, of course. To your first question, my analysis um, where I'm at in terms of my PhD is this. Our young people currently are living in environments that are chaotic. And in those chaotic environments are also is traumatic experiences that these young people experience every single day. As I said, they hear about the violence, they see the violence, they have perceived notions of violence which creates fear. So this notion of, I don't want that to happen to me, is what goes through the minds of all of our young people. You know, a government report that came out just before the end of the year said what? The likelihood for a child to get stabbed is what, between what, 20 past or quarter past mm. three yeah. to half five? It's a dangerous hour, yeah. So yeah. imagine if mum clocked out at half six. There so we're go. telling young people that, you know what, it's scary to be in the major cities. Mm. It's scary to be in London, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, because this is what might happen to you. And we're kind of leaving young people to kind of figure it out. And they live in environments where they see individuals that potentially are going to cause harm to them. Ask them the very basic question of where you're from, what postcode you're from, what ends are you from. And that's enough to be traumatic in the life of a young person that's just trying to navigate their way to school, mm. to college, to work. So young people develop these kind of nihilistic tendencies and thought processes that in order for me to make it, it just has to be destruction. I ain't going to make it to 21 anyway. I'm not going to make it to 30 anyway, so it's either I get killed mm. or I'm going to kill before that situation takes place. They even make songs about it now. Mm. I don't want to die young. I'd rather get, get, get um, judged by 12 than buried by 6. You know, that get rich or die trying mentality, it's nihilistic. So I argue that in that nihilistic context where young people develop those thought processes of nihilism that is all about destruction because I'm so traumatised and I can't deal with that trauma, no one ain't helping me with that trauma. I argue that the new variable which I answered earlier about social media, I believe that young people are like this anyway mm. because the environments that they come from, that they did not create themselves, that these environments were created. And then when they come into contact with social media, what social media does, it create, creates narcissistic tendencies because it's all about, look at me, look what I'm doing. So you got nihilistic mentality with social media that creates narcissistic behavior. And then what do we see on the streets? Men are prepared now to shoot after each other on camera because now we're so obsessed with the cameras. Now we're stabbing each other on camera. Not only are we doing that, we're humiliating each other on camera, stripping people naked on camera. What else are we doing on camera? We're now documenting our friends dying on camera. So now we're seeing violence through the lens of the camera. Mm. And young people now are starting to learn violence. They're starting to understand traits of violence, humiliation and shame, that in order for you to kind of deal with the fact that you're going through a traumatic experience, I just need to document it. And if I'm engaged in beef, I need to do it online. So now if you go back 20 years and you speak to a gangster 20 years ago, he would say to you, the rule of the book was you would never put anything online, but what you haven't taken into consideration is those stages what I've just mentioned. And the last and final point before I answer the original question is one of the things that we don't pay attention to and don't discuss is the multinational corporations and organizations mm -hmm. that make millions of pounds and dollars off the bloodshed of our children. Never once do I hear BBC, Channel 4, Radio 1 Extra, your Charlie Sloss, your Tim Westwoods ever get entered into these conversations. But what these individuals do is that they exploit our communities as cultural vultures. They come into our communities and they give the golden ticket. Mm. They say, I'm going to make you rich. Mm. I'm going to get you out the hood. I'm going to give you an opportunity. And guess what? 
We can't say that they're not. We can just look in terms of the industry now that these individuals are going on tour. These individuals are buying mansions. These people are doing well for themselves and their fam families. But what message are they sending to our children and our communities? It's self-destruction. Because just like when hip-hop started many years ago and it was about freedom, justice, and equality and fight the power and fight against oppression and someone then came in and said, you know what, rap about bitches, hoes, killing, bloodshed, because that's going to make more money because sex sells, violence sells, bloodshed sells, and all of those things are very profitable. Do the exact same type of thing and you go in the community and look where the hip-hop industry has now taken us. What's happening now with drill music? So when young people say to me, Craig, well, the reality is that I've only got two options. I have a Saudish drugs or I make this music. And in my world, mm -hmm. it's kind of one of the most challenging things to respond to because when music videos go out in my community, murders happen 48 hours later. So we can't ignore that. So I'm not saying that social media is the reason for the bloodshed of our community. And I'm not going to go with the, with the commissioner, Dick, and her kind of argument that social media and music is the only reason why it's violent, because you're ignoring the, the factors that I mentioned earlier. And social media is now being used as a scapegoat to say that it's the reason, but at the same time, we as a community need to be critical about these things as well. And my critical analysis is that, no, it's not the sole reason, but it's a contributing factor and a trigger just like the poverty, the austerity, the domestic violence, the adverse childhood experiences, the mental health, and all of the other things that I've mentioned today. So when we talk about engaging with the issue, we have to also be honest. And it also means that we need to get our hands dirty too. Because it also means now that if we are seeking to engage with the fundamental issues and the root causes to the problem that's creating these environments for young people to join gangs, then that means that we need to go back to understanding economics. Because if you don't understand economics, just telling kids don't jump on the county line and don't jump in the trap don't make no sense because they want money in their pocket. If you're going to tell these young men stop picking up the knife and stop picking up the guns to harm each other, then we need to engage with fear. We need to engage with the mindset and changing the mindset to make them comfortable to understand that in the environments in which they live are not perceived threats of fear. And if they are, we need to also engage with that. We need to also engage in politics and hold people accountable. Because when you look at the Home Office and you look at House of Parliament, and anytime it's a conversation about youth violence, you only always see about three or four MPs in the room, mm. but badgers get killed and their skin's being used and it's rammed to the door. That shows that even at that level, maybe people's reality is not the same as our reality and maybe they don't care as the same level that we care. But then we have to also address the elephant in the room with that. But an elephant in the room is that we don't want to talk about race, gender, and class. Because the reality is, and we have to be honest as well, that unfortunately when that young girl, that white young female died as a consequence of knife crime, then Theresa May says, you know what, let's have a round table discussion. I've been out here for 15 years, so what happened to the round table discussion when the children from all of our different communities was being killed? And it's not bad, it should be a racial thing, but we need to understand that we live in a racialized social structure. And in that racialized social structure, unfortunately, we categorize crime. And it just so happens that knife and gun crime in county lines is seen as a problem just for people from black and ethnic minority groups. And the only way to engage in that problem, because it's their problem, and they did it, and they created it, punish them, lock them up, throw away the key, as opposed to dealing with it from a public health perspective that deals with the issues and getting your hands dirty with the things that I'm speaking about. That's also along with economics and politics. Well, yes, is all I can say to that. And really, I get schooled on this thing. 20 years I've been in this field. Um, but what you've just said there, is as deep and as rich as we need to go to really understand this issue. And I'm definitely saying we need to do a part two because I just know you've just scratched the surface. Every right. time, man. What I've got to say is, from the bottom of my heart, honestly, what I've seen in terms of how you've grown um, and just the work that you are doing on the ground, the street academia you've managed to kind of bring to the table is a beautiful thing to watch. Um, and I just want to say thank you, power to, to you. Um, bro, it's brilliant just to have this level of engagement. Yeah, man. I know this is going to be a massive blessing yeah. to people. And um, yeah, man, let's do this again time really again. soon. Come thank on, you man. very much. Yeah. Respect the team. Nice yeah. one, nice one. Thank you. Yeah.